Hello, today I'm going to go over all of the problems on this practice for the final exam for physics. Please keep in mind I won't be going too deep, too in depth into each topic because there are 36 questions and it would take too long. So starting with the first one, the baseball is thrown straight upwards and returns to the ground five seconds later. What it was its initial velocity upward? So when a ball is thrown up, let me make the size a bit smaller. When the ball is thrown up, and let's say that they say it takes five seconds to get back to the ground, that means it took 2.5 seconds to go up and 2.5 seconds to go down. So we can just analyze only the first part of the motion and that would just be fine. So we know that it took 2.5 seconds at its maximum height, it would have a velocity of zero. So velocity final is zero. We know that the entire time it's, it's experiencing an acceleration of negative 9.8 meters per second squared due to Earth gravity. And the initial velocity is what we want to figure out. So the equation we can use here is velocity final is equal to velocity initial plus acceleration times time. So Substituting our values in, we'll get so it would be twenty four point five meters per second, which is a so that's the answer. All right, <clears throat> ball is thrown horizontally from the top of a building at a speed of six point five meters per second lands 37 meters away from the building, how tall is the building? So if you draw kind of a plane here and look at the initial velocity of the, of the, the ball, it says thrown horizontally, so meaning its velocity is that way, so there's no x, there's no y component to it says the initial velocity is 16.5 meters per second. So I would analyze two parts of its motion simultaneously, and the thing that they share is the time. So for the um, horizontal component of its motion, it's got an initial velocity of 16.5, because this is to the right, perfectly to the right. Now. There are no other forces acting in that direction, so the final velocity is also going to be the same thing, so you can just write velocity alone as that. It's displaced 37 meters away from the building, so the displacement in the x direction is 37 meters. So using this you can find time because displacement equals velocity if velocity is constant times time, so then 37, 16.5 t, and then um, T is two point two four seconds. Now in the y direction, the initial velocity is zero because this is the initial velocity and there's no y component to it, it's just being thrown directly horizontal. The acceleration in the y direction, since you're on Earth, it's always assumed to be negative 9.8 meters per second squared <coughs> and time until the end is going to be the same thing as it was up here that's the only thing they share time so then they're asking the, the height of the building so you'd have to find the displacement in the y direction meaning you'd use the equation um, let me pull up this you would use the equation that goes like this. That's useful. So this is zero, so then this whole term is zero. So we just start here. One over two, negative 9.8, 2.2, 2.2, 2.2, 2.2, 2.2, 2.2, 2.2, 2.2, 2.2, 2.2, 2.2, 2.2, 2.2, 2.2, 2.2, 2.2, 2.2, 2
3.24 squared. So the answer is negative 24.6 meters. Now the reason it's negative is because the ball was starting from the top of the building and then fell down so that it's in the negative direction since we defined the acceleration of Earth to be negative. So the answer would be B. That's the height of the building. So we delete everything so we can have space. Crane is lifting a 2,000 kilogram load with a cable whose braking strength is 22,000 newtons. What is the maximum upward acceleration that the load can be given? So the tension on this string would be, first of all, if you're just holding the weight without moving it. So let's say you're holding the mass, it's 2,000 kilograms. There's already a tension of 2,000 times g, which is gravity. So 2,000 times 9.8. If you accelerate it upward, uh, there's going to be an additional force that's or tension really that's going to be on the string. So that would be its mass, which is again 2,000 times the uh, upward acceleration. Meaning, if they say the tension, the maximum tension is 22,000. We replace this with 22,000. We can find the maximum acceleration it can take. So that number would be box starts from rest and slides down an incline that is 10 meters long. At the bottom it is traveling at 5 meters per second. If the incline makes an angle of 20 degrees with respect to the horizontal, what is the coefficient of friction between the box and the incline? It's good to visualize these. So we don't know its mass, but I'm going to draw these vectors as acceleration values. So it's being accelerated downward with gravity is 9.8. Now, whenever you want to find the component of this that is in this direction, we know the angle of this is 20 degrees. So this, this would be the component of gravity that pulls it directly uh, parallel to the incline. That would be 9.8 sine 20 degrees. So 20 sine times 9.8 is, if we do that, 3.35. And these are acceleration values, by the way. These are not force values. You could do force, but they don't give us mass, so I'm not going to do force. The force that um, is the normal force that pulls it upward or really pushes it upward is going to be 9.8 cosine of 20 degrees, which is 9.21. So that's the acceleration as a result of the normal force. Now, <coughs> the they're asking for the coefficient of friction. The friction force would be equal to this. So the, actually, no, not that. The normal force, in this case, normal acceleration, because we're doing acceleration, times the coefficient of friction. So it'd be 9.21 times coefficient of kinetic friction, which is UK. Okay, so that is the friction. So now, if we write the Newton's first law for this, we know that acceleration is equal to the net the net acceleration, I should say, so I guess adding up all the accelerations in this direction that is parallel to the um, incline, you would get 3.35 in the positive direction 
and pushing it back in the negative direction, you would get 9.21 kinetic friction coefficient. Now, how do we calculate A? We're given some information. It says it slides down the incline that is 10 meters long. So we know that displacement x is 10 meters. This is a basic kinematic problem. Velocity final is 5 meters per second. Um, yeah, there must be something else there they give us. Oh, yeah. It starts from rest on top. So velocity initial is that. So we can find acceleration this way. We can use the equation that goes like this. So velocity final is 5 squared. Velocity initial is 0. We can just not write that. And this is 10. So 5 squared divided by So the acceleration here is 1.25 meters per second squared. Meaning, if I want to move this over, we know the net acceleration now is 1.25 in the direction of movement. And we've defined the direction, positive direction of acceleration this way. Because this is positive and this is negative. We can now solve for the coefficient of kinetic friction. So this will be that's this. If you solve this, you'll get 0 0.228, which is basically B. Automobile traveling at 90 kilometers an hour around a curve of radius 375 meters. Okay. So in this scenario, we're talking about uniform circular motion. So in this case, the so you're going around a curve, okay, with a certain radius. So this is like your car. It's only not not going around a full circle, but the force that is the centripetal force that pulls you toward the middle is the friction, okay, of the road. Now, the equation for the friction of the road would be the normal force of your car times the coefficient of kinetic friction. Now, the normal force of the car is usually if most cases mg, so mass of the car times gravity constant. Okay. And we know that in uniform circular motion, force equals mass velocity squared over radius, the distance to the center of the circle. So therefore, if this is our centripetal force, as we just explained, this would be mv squared r. All right. Now we can cancel out m's because they're on both sides, and then we can solve for the coefficient of kinetic friction here. Now g is nine point eight. Uk is what we're trying to figure out. Radius is three seventy five meters. Velocity square is given to us in ninety kilometers an hour, so we have to convert to meters per second. The way we convert this, one kilometers is a thousand meters, and an hour. So this would cancel out with that. One hour is sixty minutes, and one minute is sixty seconds. You get this is twenty-five. Let me check. So we get 25, so velocity squared here is 25 squared. So 
So the value is, yeah, so the value I get is 0 0.17 for the, for the friction. Oh, this just bothers me. Spacecraft orbits an unknown planet at a distance of 5.2 times 10 to the seventh meters from its center. The period of its orbit is 52 hours, and what is the mass of the planet? You have to combine two equations here to solve this. So the first one is that accelerate the radial acceleration in uniform circular motion. This is on our equation sheet. All of these pretty much are. Is this. Now, if you put mass here, mass and acceleration is force. You have to put mass on the other side. This would be the centripetal force, so you should just call that force. Now, in terms of gravity and planetary motion, the, the force toward the center is going to be gravity. And the equation for gravity is, let me actually write it up here because I'd like the equations to be next to each other. The gravity equation is g, which is a constant, okay, m, which is the mass of the planet in the middle, m is the mass of the planet that is smaller than r squared is the distance between them. So now, velocity in uniform circular motion is equal to 2 pi r over t, which is the period, meaning how long does it take for the planet to orbit the other planet once, or how long one cycle takes in any uniform circular motion. So you can replace this m v right here with this expression. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just take v out and put 2 pi r over t squared. And that was squared to, to begin with. So now we have, let me get rid of this. We have two nice equations. We're going to set the f's equal to each other because they're basically the same. So we would get gmm over r squared and we get this horrid mess right here. Okay. Now the masses, these are the mass of the small planet. We can cancel that out, so I'm going to erase both. Now we can distribute the 2 here, so I'm going to just do that real quick. So I'm going to erase these. r squared, 2 pi squared, and then t squared. Now we can move this t to the, to the bottom effectively. So it's not annoying. Uh, my erase thing is too big. Hold on. So now you can realize that we can cancel out one of the r's because r squared on top, r to the first on the bottom. So this can go and then this can become r to the first. Divide both sides by r. This r will come to the bottom and this will become r to the third. So radius cubed. And so that's looking good. They're asking for the for the mass of the planet, okay? And they're saying the spacecraft orbits an unknown planet. So the planet is the thing being orbited, meaning it's the big thing with the big mass. So we want to solve for m here. So we take g to the bottom, r this to the top, and we would get the equation we need. Now that we have the equation we need, let me actually solve the problem. So this will be, this is easy. So this is uh, 5.2 times 10 to the seventh to the third power. T is 52 hours. The problem with this is whenever you're using these equations, please use uh, SI units. 52 hours will not work. 52 hours, well, let me just shorthand this. An hour is 3,600 seconds. So 52 times 3,600 is 187, sorry, what? Yeah. So that's how long it takes to orbit it. And then G is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Yeah. That's on the equation sheet. So then, shove this into my calculator.
Okay, so I get something like 2.37 times 10 to the 24th kilograms for the mass of the big planet, and that is indeed what we get here. Yeah, equations on the planetary motion chapter are a delight. 64th kilo, 64 kilogram mass is pushed at a constant speed, again, up a frictionless plane at, for a distance of 18 meters by a force parallel to the plane. If the plane makes an angle of 24 degrees above the horizontal, how much work was done? So let me draw this plane thing they're talking about. So the angle here is 24 degrees, and it's saying the distance of 18 meters. So 18 meters. Now, here I think we're more, uh, let me explain the equations first. So this is how much work is done. Work is force times distance. Also, you can think of force as just, if force is mg, mgh, it's gravitational potential energy. The amount of potential energy you add to it is the same as the amount of work you do on it. So we can just calculate um, the work done on this object by how high it moved based on h and then plug in its mass and gravity constant and get the answer. Now, how do we figure out how high it was pushed up? Well, we know it was pushed up 18 meters along this little incline that it was 24 degrees. degrees. So this would actually be, uh, you can do the trigonometry, the quick way I memorize it is this value times sine of this angle, so 18 sine of 24 degrees it would be seven point three two yeah so if we go here and put his height seven point three two nine point eight here mass if this thing was sixty four Get something like four five nine two joules, which is close to this answer. C. One moment. I'm going to turn on the AC. It's really hot in here. Hopefully it's not too loud. 10 kilogram mass starts at the top of an incline that is eight meters long and makes an angle of 40 degrees above the horizontal. As it slides down, there's a constant frictional force of 38, 23, not 38, 23.8 newtons. What is the speed at the bottom? So we have an incline problem again. So the angle here is, I'm sorry, I scrolled to the top without trying to. Does that mean to do it? Okay. So 40 degrees is the angle it makes with the horizontal. Incline is eight meters long, so that's how that is. And it's a 10 kilogram mass. Now if we analyze the forces that are on it, we have a gravity which is 98 newtons. We've got this, really this should be a component of gravity that is um, what is this? 40 sine times 98 would be 62, basically 63 newtons. By the way, this was, I should have explained this, but 98 sine of 40. If you want to find this component of gravity, that's always the equation. It's the, the gravity times sine of the angle. And then the they ask about, the, they say the constant friction force is they give us this 23.8. So you don't have to go through the hassle of finding normal force and all that. <coughs> so those are the forces acting on it. And they ask, what is the speed at the bottom? So to do this, we have to find the net force that is in this plane of movement. So the, so the net force here is 63, if we count this direction as positive, and then if we count that direction as negative, that's going to be 23.8. So 
So this is 39.19 Newtons. Now I kind of didn't need to do the Newtons thing because we can just we just need to find acceleration. So we know that this equals mass times acceleration, and we know mass is 10. We can find acceleration, so that's just divided by 10. 3.919 meters per second squared. So then, we know it starts at the top of the incline. We safe assumption to say this is probably starting at rest, unless told otherwise. And then, incline is eight meters long, so displacement is eight meters. And we just said we just calculated acceleration. It's three point that meters. I don't know what the hell this is on. Okay. There we go. So now we have to find final velocity. So the equation I would use here is the is the this one. Now this is zero, so we can just start with this. So this is two. So this is seven point nine, so so that is D. An elevator with a mass of 1,900 kilograms, okay, calculate the power required to lift it in a vertical distance of 50 meters in a time of 20 seconds if there's a constant friction of force of 750 newtons. Power is equal to work over time. Now work is also force times distance, and then, yeah. So, the force here required to, to push this elevator up would be just to lift it up. You need a you need a counteract gravity, so the force here would turn into mg, and its mass is 1,900. So I'm going to just go 1,900. Uh, g is 9.8. Now that's not the only force you have to overcome. You also have to overcome gravity plus the the constant frictional force of 1750 newtons so this is 1750 newtons and this whole thing which is the force you have to overcome gets multiplied by the distance you have to push it up 50 meters so this is be 50 and the time here is 20 seconds so this would be 20 For those of you who want the equation fully written out with variables, I can do that. So this would be force times distance over time. And then this was, since we have two forces here, we have force of gravity. So G plus force friction. And we know that in our case, the force of gravity is mg and that the other one is just force of friction. This is just basically the displacement vertically. So if I solve it, let's see what I get. So, yeah. I get something like, and again, we have to care, be careful with the units here. This uh, work is always in joules. So this is going to be in 50925 joules per second. Now, another unit that is equivalent to joules per second is just watts. And the answers here are in kilowatts. So if we want to convert to kilowatts, if we want to take, okay, I'm sorry. If we want to take this number and convert it to kilowatts, we would have to go like this. We'd have to go 50925 watts 
and then we know that a thousand watts is one kilowatt and watt is joules per second by the way you should know that it's very useful to know so if I get 50.95 so that's basically D all right let's move on to number 10 Now it says, ball of mass m traveling at 10 meters per second makes a hit on collision, an elastic collision. It's a elastic collision, so it's it is elastic. Because if you say n elastic collision, people think in elastic, and that's just wrong. So it's elastic with a second ball of mass 2m initially at rest after the collision. The first ball will have a velocity of Equations, whenever you have a any collision, whether it's elastic or not, you can use this equation. So mass of the first object plus velocity of the first object plus mass. I hate subscripts, but just want to make sure you understand this good. Um, this means after the event has happened. This is the velocity after the event happened. Now, that's with any collision right here. So I'm going to write any collision. If it is elastic, meaning no kinetic energy is lost in the process to other things like heat and sound and other friction type nonsense, you can use this equation as well as that this one. So you go like that equals that. So velocity of the first object before and after the collision equals velocity of the other object before and after the collision. So if we want to plug our things in here, and since it's elastic, we can use both both of them. Okay. So that should kind of tell you which one to use in which situation. So the Mass is m for the first object, so m, and it's going 10 meters per second. And the second object is stationary at first, so I'm just not going to include it. And then this first object, we don't know what its velocity is at the end. And this second object goes and has a mass of 2m, and we don't know what its velocity is at the end as well. All right. So then the other equation... Velocity of our, ob our object minus object number one initially is 10, so this is 10. At the end, I don't know what it is, so it's kind of what we're solving for. The, the second object has a velocity of zero at the beginning, so this will be zero, which is basically means it doesn't exist in this equation. And then V2, so that, that we don't know as well. All right. So now, since we're solving for velocity of the first ball, so this, we can plug this uh, expression in instead of this. So I'm going to rewrite, um, where, where did I put this? I want to make this awkward and put it in the bottom, so let's do that. Okay. So 10m and then m v v1 final plus 10 plus v1 final and then you'll get 20 m plus 2 m v1 and then you'll get this if you rewrite it you can cancel m out of all of them because it's in every term so 10 equals Velocity of the first object, finally, I mean, after the collision, I mean, I say finally, I mean after the collision. 20 plus 2, like this, this will be 3 times velocity, and then the 20 will go on the other side, that'll be negative uh, 10. So the velocity of this at the end will be 
negative 3.3 meters per second, meaning it's moving in the opposite direction that it initially was going to, towards. So this will be A. Okay. So understanding that equation is really useful. Okay, a 720 newton force applied to a, I think it says 120 gm ball, I think it means grams ball, gram ball for a time of 0 0.25 seconds, calculate the momentum, assuming initially it was at rest. What we know is that, um, well, momentum, let's just talk about this fundamentally, momentum final is change in momentum plus initial momentum. It says initial momentum is zero, so this is zero, meaning, oh, this is, oh my god, I'm sorry, guys, let me rewrite this. Momentum final is change in momentum plus the um, momentum initially. Okay. Say change in momentum is zero, so this is zero, meaning it was initially at rest. So if it's initially at rest, momentum is mv. So if this is zero, then the whole momentum becomes zero. So they're asking us for final momentum, and final momentum in this case is exactly the same as change in momentum. Now the equation that you'll find useful in doing this is change in momentum equals force times time. Okay, so force here is 720, time here is 0 0.25. So this will be um, 180 and so it'll be this. And momentum has the units kilograms, meters per second, because when you look at this equation, the mass is in kilograms. The V is um, velocity, meters per second. Okay. Move everything upward a little bit. Truck has a mass of 4820 kilograms and a wheelbase, meaning distance from the front and the back wheels, of 4.8 meters. If the center of the mass of the truck is located 1.9 meters behind the front wheels, where should a 5,450 kilogram load be placed relative to the front wheels in order to have equal weight on both sides of the So let's imagine the truck being here and this being the front wheels, so front and back wheels and then let's say this is zero and this is m this is um the back they say that yeah they say the distance between the front and the back wheels is 4.8 meters now they tell us in the problem that the truck has a mass of 4820 when you're doing these problems you can treat that mass as being concentrated in the center of mass of the truck which is located 1.9 meters behind the front wheels Meaning, we need to figure something out. Like that's around like here. That's four, eight, twenty kilograms. And then we're told that we have a five thousand four hundred fifty kilogram load. And so, where should we put it to make sure that we have equal weight on both sets of wheels? Meaning, how do we make it so that the center of mass of the entire system will be exactly in the middle of the back wheels and the front wheels? So we have to put this mass. We don't know where we have to put it, but we do know its mass. It's 5,450. So the equation for the center of mass of any system is mass of, you do however many objects you have here. We have two, so I'm doing two of these. But the mass of first object times the position of the first object plus mass of the second object times position of the second object. Okay. And again, this has to be uh, with, within the same frame of reference, meaning when you write, put plug in this position value, it should be all relative to the front in this case, because that's useful to do. The problem asks relative to the front of the, asks relative to the front wheels. Mass of the, the op, let's, let's say the mass of the truck first, let's do 4820, so, um, actually, I don't like doing this on top, I like to do it on the bottom. 
4820 and then we have here 1.9 mass of the second object which is the the load is 5450 in a position we don't know yet so we're trying to figure that out and their masses is add up together is just this and we want the center of mass to be and they want it to be um, in the middle perfectly so that would be 4.8 divided by 2 or really 4.8 plus 0 divided by 2 that's 2.4 Okay, 2.4 meters from the front wheels. So if you solve for x, which I'm going to attempt to do here, All right, so the answer I get is for position of the second one is 2.84 meters so right there it's D playground merry-go-round consists of a flat disc with a radius of 1.5 meters and a moment of inertia of 40 kilograms meters squared it's rotating freely at 15 revolutions per minute when a 30 kilogram child jumps on the edge what is the new angular velocity of the merry-go-round plus the child? The concept we need to sort of explain here is the concept of angular momentum. So linear momentum was mv, but angular momentum is um, moment of inertia times angular velocity. So meaning angular velocity, not angular velocity, moment of inertia times angular velocity initial should be equal to moment of inertia final times angular velocity final. Now usually in the linear ones we don't often see a case except in the case of maybe where two objects kind of get stuck to each other after a collision. We don't usually see a case of mass changing but here the moment of inertia can change because the ch child can jump on on the merry-go-round. So initially the merry-go-round has a moment of inertia of 40 in an angular velocity of 15 revolutions per minute. If you make, if your units of angular velocity are the same on both, so you don't have to convert to radians per second, and they're asking for RPMs here, which is revolutions per minute. Now here's where things get interesting. The angular velocity at the end is not, not angular velocity. The moment of inertia at the end is not gonna be the same thing because the child just jumped on the merry-go-round. So the way you calculate the moment of inertia usually is mass, why can I not write? Mass of the object that are on the thing rotating times the radius squared. So if you remember this mr squared thing. Now, the merry-go-round itself already has a moment of inertia of 40. So whatever moment of inertia we're adding to it after the child is just going to be added to it. So this is the moment of inertia after the child gets on it. And so this is the moment of inertia that the merry-go-round has on its own, and this is the child being added to it. The child has a mass of 30 kilograms. The radius is 1.5 because she jumps on the edge. So that's 1.5 and 40. So then this will be 10.75. It would be kilograms, meters. Um, squared but yeah so now we can find the final angular velocity it is yeah it is f so 5.58 revolutions per minute which would be C A torque of 3.1 newton meters is applied to a wheel that is initially at rest if the moment of inertia of the wheel is 0 0.85 kilograms meters squared. What is the angular velocity after 11 seconds? The equation we need to use here is that torque equals moment of inertia times 
angular acceleration, which is alpha. So if we're told the torque is 3.1 and that the moment of inertia is 0 0.85, we can find the angular acceleration there. <coughs> so the angular acceleration would be something like 3.65 radians per second squared so they were told to find the final angular velocity after 11 seconds so we know this is kind of a kinematics thing oh, time is 11 seconds initially at rest so initial angular velocity is zero the acceleration angularly is 3.65 radians per second square and then the final angular acceleration as we don't know. The equation we can use here is that final velocity equals initial velocity plus acceleration time and this is all angular stuff not linear. Um, if this is zero then we just say 3.65 times 11 seconds so this will be 40.1, yeah, 40.1 radians per second squared. Radians per second, not squared, because this is velocity. So there. All right. Railroad car with a mass of 4,000 kilograms is going east at 3 meters per second when it collides with a second car whose mass is... 25,000 kilograms going east at the, going east same direction at 1 meters per second on the same track. If the crew cars, cars coupled together, how much kinetic energy was lost in the collision? So here, if you set up the, again, as I said before, let's go up. In any collision, these are momentums right here. The momentum is always conserved whether it's elastic or inelastic. In this case, it's inelastic because they actually become coupled together after the collision meaning they basically move as one object so if you calculate you can actually pull up uh, I'm not going to pull it up from up there I'll just write it again so mass of the first object plus mass of the plus the velocity of the first object plus mass of the second object velocity of the second object if they become together, this is mass of 1 plus 2, and then velocity final of both objects, because they become one object effectively. You don't need to put the thing there. Okay. So, mass of the first object is 40,000. Velocity of it is 3. If we define east as being positive, then the other object is 25,000. Velocity of it is 1 in the same direction, so they're both positive. And then you will have their masses added together, which is 25,000 plus 40,000. So 65,000 kilograms. And velocity final will be what we are solving for. So. Velocity at the end will be 2.23. I shouldn't write like wrong. There. This is velocity of the both cars on the railroad once they're stuck together at the end. Now, the, they're saying how much kinetic energy was lost in the process. The kinetic energy initially, we have two objects moving. We have kinetic energy equation, by the way, is 1 over 2 mv squared of the first object and then 1 over 2 m2 v2 squared for the second object. So that's initially what the unit kinetic energy is. And then after the collision, or the coupling really, you get 1 over 2 mass of both objects 
and then velocity of them together. And this really, I didn't put subscripts here because I hate subscripts, but there. So if we just calculate, really put in values. So this was 40,000, that's 4,000. And then velocity was three squared. This is 25,000. And this is one squared. And this is 65,000. And this is, as we said, uh, 2.23 squared so that we get so this will be 161730 it's actually more close to 1 joules of kinetic energy and then the other one will be let's see, 20 per So if you subtract what you had initially, but yet finally you get how much you lost. So you get 176. Put this in scientific notation, it's like 1.76 times 10 to the fifth joules, which is about 1.8 times 10 to the fifth joule, which is C. All right. Go on the back of the, let me read the question first. A thin circular hoop is released at the top of an incline. Eight meters long, makes an angle of 37 degrees above the horizontal. What is the speed at the bottom of the incline? Let me get the equation sheet that has the backside. One moment. If you look at the back of the equation sheet, you'll see that we've got next to the right side of the fluids, we have like rolling without slipping equations. On the far right of that, you have I and then subscripted loop like this. So it's I. It doesn't say, who, yeah, you do say. That's the moment of inertia for a bunch of different objects. So since we have a circular hoop, which is basically the same thing as a loop, for this object, we can treat its uh, moment of inertia as being mr squared, which is its mass times its radius squared. So we know that I is mr squared. They would give us value in the test or it would be clear off the equation sheet. So the circular hoop is released. So we have a circular hoop released at the top of the incline. So it's, if it's released, it probably means velocity is zero at the top. And it goes down, rolling without slipping. So there's both rotational kinetic energy and linear kinetic energy. And we're told that the incline is eight meters long and the angle is 37 degrees, meaning that this height that it went down, as I said again, it was sine of 37, sine of the angle times the height. So 37 sine times eight is, is, 4.815 meters. So there is, there's that. That's the height that it dropped. So using energy, it's, it's a lot easier to use energy. Don't even know, don't want to solve this with kinematics. I don't think it's probably possible, but it's just hell. We know that the kinetic energy and the potential energy in order to be conserved here uh, the ones that are relevant are are these, okay? So this is gravity, potential energy, this is linear kinetic energy, and then this is rotational kinetic energy. 
and you have to say that these are all initial and then at the end you get the final height and then you get the final linear velocity and the final angular acceleration angular velocity not angular acceleration now you know that initially the thing is at rest meaning it's what do you call it angular velocity is also at rest so these are zero so you can ignore these two terms essentially those would become zero so you just get mg height initial at the end i mean if we call this height basically here as our frame of reference once it's at the bottom its height should be zero so this should also be zero as well so meaning this entire term just goes away so we will get and these are all uh, in the, these are all final so and this is initial height now if we substitute the right i value which means mr squared we will get mr squared now there's a relationship we need to understand here as well the linear velocity is equal to the angular velocity times radius meaning angular velocity is equal to linear velocity times divided by radius so you can replace this term here angular velocity by linear velocity over radius so if you distribute this thing here the power of two thing you will get this and you realize there's an r squared on top and r squared on the bottom so these both two cancel out and then you notice that you have mass on every single term so you can get rid of that as well so the end what you end up with is gh is equals 1 over 2 v squared plus 1 over 2 v squared again so that's basically just v squared no longer 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 just v squared yeah simplifies it a lot so now you can plug in your values so you know the height that it went down was 4.185 And we can find, they're saying the speed at the bottom of the incline, so that probably means linear speed, not angular speed. All right, so that is 6.87 meters per second, which would be this one, C. A tank contains mercury at a depth of 10 centimeters with a water at a depth of 23 centimeters floating on top. What is the gauge pressure at the bottom of the tank? In these kinds of situations, we know that the pressure that is exerted by any fluid at everything that's underneath the fluid is by this equation. Pressure is density of the fluid and then the gravity constant times the height of the fluid, meaning how high does the fluid go above the uh, point you're trying to measure. So if we have like a container and we have fluid to up to like, I'm just trying to do an example, to have like eight meters. And we're trying to find the pressure at exactly at the bottom of this cup. It would be the density of the fluid and then would be gravity constant, and then the height would be this value right here. Okay, how high does the fluid go above your um, above your reference point as to where the what the pressure is there? In this case, we have two different fluids that are on top of us. We have the tank contains mercury and also 
Och så water. Så vi har fått sätta two up. Så pressure of water and pressure of mercury. Så Hg är mercury. Density of water is always a thousand kilograms per meters cubed. Så so, a thousand. And I should have wrote that this is... Yeah, so keep this in mind. The equations are based on this. 9.8, and then the height is... For water, it's 23 centimeters, which is 0 0.23 meters. For mercury, the density is 13.6. Now, in the right units, which is kilograms per meters cubed, it would be that time a th times a thousand. So, 13,600 is the density of mercury, and it goes up to 10 centimeters, which is 0 0.1 meters. So then if you add these up, the pressure of the pressure exerted by the mercury and pressure exerted by water, you will get My five is really weird today. Oh, okay. So converting it to kilopascals, you just divide by a thousand. So this would be fifteen. Why did it erase my A? Okay, I don't know why it erased my A. That was not very nice. Fifteen point five eight two kilopascals. So it's C. An automobile lift is operated by air pressure. If the piston diameter is 25 centimeters and the pressure is 1,100 kilopascals, what is the mass of the largest vehicle that can be raised? So in this situation, we have pressure is equal to force times area. And the force that any sort of lift, an automobile lift can give you is the mass of the car you're trying to lift times uh, the gravity constant. Because the force is mg. Now, it's, it says it's going to be a piston has a diameter of 25 centimeters. If it's a piston has a diameter of 2.5, that means if we're trying to find its area, we know that it gives us a diameter, it's going to be circular. The area of a circle is pi r squared. If diameter is 25, that means radius is 12.5 centimeters which is um, which is equal to it's just like 0 0.125 meters so then we can instead of a here we can write pi r squared so then plugging things into our equation as to what the pressure can be pi is just pi Radius is 0 0.125 squared. Mass of the car. They're asking what is the mass of the largest vehicle that can be raised. So that's what we're solving for. And then 9.8 is gravity constant. We know the maximum pressure inside. Or really just the pressure inside the, the lift is 1100. Yeah, 11, I think that's called 1100 pascals, kilopascals. So that'd be a times 1,000 for the pascals. Let me scientific notation this is annoying. So if we solve for M here, we get something like Yeah, so we get something like five five zero. Oh eh, well. We can just round I it's it's just C. It's that. A 
A tank filled with water has a small hole, 4.3 meters below the water level. What is the velocity of water that flows as it flows through the hole? There's an equation you can use here. It's called the Bernoulli's equation. So it says that pressure plus density, gravity, height, plus 1 over 2 density, velocity squared is constant. All right. Now, in this case, we're just poking a hole in the, the cup. Um, yeah. We're not really changing pressure, so I, so I think we can just ignore this because it's going to be on the other side of the equation, too. And if you want me to write out the entire equation, I can, just to make it a little clearer. Since the pressure on both sides is the same, this just becomes irrelevant. And... Initially, I mean, the water isn't moving. Let me draw it. Actually, it might be useful. Actually, that's not a good drawing. Hold on. So we have a cup. And water is up to this level. And we poke a little hole in it, and water starts to kind of come out. Now, at the top here, the water doesn't have any velocity. Here the velocity is zero. Here there is some velocity. Um, we don't know what it is, we're trying to solve for it. But we do know the height difference between these is 4.3 meters, they tell us. If we have this level as our frame of reference for the height, the height at the end here uh, is really zero. So this can basically just be zero. So this entire term uh, is irrelevant. And the water here is not moving, it's just stationary. So that also means that initially, in, or in that top situation, the velocity is zero, so this entire term can just leave. So this is the equation we get at the end. All right, and this is this height initial, this is velocity final. And I guess there isn't necessarily a time displacement, it's more of a uh, kind of a position displacement from here to here, okay? So density of water is the same, both top and, top and bottom, so we can get rid of these two. So this will be GH equals 1 over 2 V squared. So GH, um, gravity is 9.8, height is 4.3. And if we solve for velocity, we get... 9.18 meters per second. So this will be E. All right. So understanding the Bernoulli terms is really useful here. Why is this not? I hate that. Okay. Spring is suspended vertically. 5.8 kilogram weight is attached to the lower end. It stretches by 8.1 centimeters. What is per spring constant? So if it's suspended vertically, that means like, let's say we have like a ceiling here and let's say we have like a spring and let's say we hold a weight on it that's what 5.8 kilograms and let's say that once we do that the spring stretches by 8.1 centimeters and I'm going to rewrite that because I don't like the units 0 0.081 meters really okay Now, the spring constant you will notice is written always in units of newtons per meters. The meters is how, how much the spring stretches. The, the newtons is what force you put on it. Now, the force we're putting on it here, in terms of force, is only gravity. So this is 5.8 kilograms times so 9.8, so 9.8 times basically mg, so it's 56.84 newtons. So you plug that into this equation, well, not an equation really, just this sort of thing here for the spring constant. It requires, based on the situation, we know 56.84 newtons to stretch it by 0 0.081 meters. So that'll give you a spring stiffness constant of about 702 newtons per meters. So that is C. 
That's the closest answer. All right. So, 0 0.33 kilogram mass is attached to one end of a spring, executing simple harmonic motion. The amplitude of the motion is 14 centimeters, and the, the velocity is 3.7 meters per second as it passes through the equilibrium position. What is the spring constant for the spring? I wish I would just sit here and explain this in depth, but I don't have enough time for this. This is already really long. You should know that 1 over 2 mass velocity max of the something that is doing simple harmonic motion squared is equal to the 1 over 2 spring constant times amplitude squared. Now, what do I mean by amplitude? This is the maximum displacement. So if we have like a wall here and we have a spring going, actually that's a really badly drawn spring. I'm not really good at drawing springs in the horizontal direction, but let's say that this is in this is the equilibrium position here that it's at. Now, let's say that it oscillates from like this kind of distance. Okay. This right here, the maximum displacement, that's that's A. Okay. So that's the A is the maximum displacement. And at the maximum displacement, it's not moving at all. So kinetic energy is zero, but potential energy is at its max because this spring right, will, be dis will be displaced the furthest, meaning it'll push back with a really strong force. In the middle here, the velocity will be max because the kinetic energy will be at its maximum. The reason the kinetic energy will be max maximum because potential energy will be zero because the spring is at its equilibrium position, right? So the spring won't be uh, having any potential energy, the, all the energy will be kinetic. So when we say velocity maximum, we mean the velocity at the equilibrium position, which is this. So they tell us the velocity maximum or the velocity equilibrium position is 3.7. So therefore, 3.7 we can plug in. Uh, substitute in mass is 0 0.33 based on here. And then 1 over 2. 1 over 2. They still, the spring this constant is, they're asking for the spring constant, so we're solving for k. Amplitude is in 14 centimeters, so that's 0 0.14 meters. Let me just check to make sure I'm not screwing this up. Yep, 0 0.14 squared. And then the spring constant should be, let's calculate this. Alright, that'll be what on earth happened? Hold on. There. 230.49 newtons, if you're doing it, and then here's the answer. So, I'm going to get rid of this, we have space. The equation for the period of a pendulum is here. It's, I, think, I think it's in our equation sheet. I think it is, yeah. What was this? Hold on, what am I on? T is period, okay. How long it takes for the pendulum to go from, uh, so this is the equilibrium position of the pendulum, okay. Hold on, I drew this really bad. Let's say we have a ceiling and we have a pendulum. This is the equilibrium position of the pendulum. The amount of time the pendulum takes for it to go from this far end position to like the other far end position and back, the time it takes is t. Okay, that's period. Now, two. The, the equation is period is two pi over length of the pendulum over g. So g is gravity constant. L is the length of this rope. All right. So we increase the length of the pendulum by a factor of two point five. So essentially, we're doing this okay by what factor does the period change so if you just take 2.5 and you square root it you will get the factor by which the period changes because the length of the, the the length of the rope of the pendulum is in a square root so this is the square root of 2.5 is just 1.58 which is around 1.6 which is e 
Alright, so these are starting to get a little easier. I hope we don't have to spend as long on problems. Musical note A above middle C has the frequency 440 hertz. What is the wavelength of the sound? Okay. We need to understand about any wave, whether it's sound, light, whatever, is velocity equals the wavelength times the frequency of the wave. So if the velocity of sound is always 340 or around 340 depending on temperature and stuff. They are asking for the wavelength of the sound. So they're asking for this, which is wavelength, the lambda. We know the frequency is 440 hertz. And by the way, frequency should always be hertz. Velocity should always be meters per second. This should always be meters. Sometimes you'll see slightly different units. You should convert them accordingly. And hertz is one over seconds. So it's just cycles over seconds. So then this will be 0 0.7722. 27 meters, so that's basically C. A sound source transmits sounds uniformly in all, direc all directions. If the intensity is 2 watts per meter squared at a distance of 1 meter, what is the distance? Uh, what is it at a distance of 3 meters? Uh, so this is not a problem I ever saw in, in my class. However, you have to understand the concept of intensity. Intensity essentially is the power, right? over the area. Now when sound waves transmit the sound, it kind of expands. I can't really draw it because it wouldn't make any sense. It, the sound waves expand in a sphere in all directions. Meaning that this area value here is the area of a sphere, which is, if I remember correctly, is 4 pi r squared. Okay. I think that's right. So we have two situations here. We have one situation where the intensity is 2 watts per meter squared at a distance of 1 meter. If we move 2 meters back, the intensity should change. And the, the distance here is denoted by this r here, Okay, how far we are from the um, sound source itself. But the power of the sound source never changes. It has, still has the same amount of energy. So. In the first situation, we have two here for the intensity. We don't know the power, but we do know that we are one meter away, so one squared. So if we, so if we solve for p, p will be twenty-five point one three um, powers in watts or joules per second. Okay. Now for the second situation. We are three meters away, so we have the same. Again, our sound source always transmits the same amount of energy in terms of, you know, joules per second, watts. But we're further away, so this R value here would change. So this R would be now three. And so if we solve this, I get something like zero point two 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 forever um, watts per meter squared, which is this. All right. So that's how you solve that problem. An automobile horn emits a sound frequency of 800 hertz measured by a stationary observer. So meaning that the actual frequency is 800 because that's what it is by stationary, sorry, stationary observer. What frequency would be measured by an observer moving toward the source at 35 meters per second? So the Doppler's equation on this, which is if you are the, you as the observer or the source of the sound are moving toward each other, whether that's moving to you or you're moving to it, here's the equation for that, okay? So it's the speed of sound here, the B40, 340. So this is the fre perceived frequency, this is the actual frequency of the sound. Now on top here is going to be the frequency of the observer, so the, free, or the frequency velocity of the observer, sorry. And this is the velocity of the source. So if the source is moving toward you, it's negative. If it's moving away from you, this is positive. In this case, it says the, the observer is moving toward the source of the sound at 35. So the actual frequency is 800. So 800. So this is 340. The observer is moving again. Observer moving toward the source. Please don't put it on the other side, on the bottom. And the source is not moving, so this is just 340. 
So if you solve that, you get D. And that this is 882.35, something like that. So yeah. A string that is 0 0.55 meters long has a mass of 0 0.25 grams. It is placed under 25 newtons of tension and plucked. What is the lowest frequency it can produce? The equation we need to know here is that frequency, again, it's um, this is for a standing wave, like a, like a string sort of thing, is equal to the um, number of, of standing half waves on the, on the string. So like if you have a string, and let's say you have like, initially the string is like this, but you start to pluck it from one side, you'll get like these little waves that'll form, these, these sort of standing waves. If there's like one half wave like this, the N is one. If you have like more, it's not that good, but there. If you have like more, the N is two. You can keep going basically with Ns, but that's what this N is here. And there's a, there's a frequency right here, it's, it's, denotes like what harmonic it is. So like the first harmonic would be n equals one. Now this is the velocity of the wave times uh, two times the length of the string. Now velocity of the wave, sometimes it'll just be sound, it'll just be um, speed of sound if you're doing mu musical instruments usually, but uh, some, if it's not producing waves that we can hear, then usually it'll be a little different. The velocity will be square root of the tension that the string is under over u. And u is basically just the mass of the string over the length of the string, all right? So the mass per length um, sort of density ratio. Not really density, just the really mass per unit length ratio. So we're told that um, so if, if you want us for this problem, we can just substitute in V into here. So I'm just going to erase V and put this in place of it. Okay. It says lowest frequency you can produce. So there are different frequencies it could produce based on the N value. Since it's asking for the lowest, the lowest N can be as one. So I'm going to put one, two, and then length is 0 0.55. Tension is, is 75 newtons. Mass is 0 0.25 grams, which is calculate kilograms of that. So 0 0.25 divided by 1,000 is 0. It's annoying, but three zeros. And then that is um, the length on the bottom, which is 0 0.55. So if we solve for the frequency here, So that is something like 369.27 hertz. So that is right there is what we get. Right. An organ pipe that is open at both ends is 1.4 meters long. Calculate the fundamental frequency of vibration. As we talked about in the last equation, the fundamental frequency of vibration essentially is when n equals 1. So what's the frequency when n equals 1? That's what fundamental frequency means. And in an organ pipe that is open at both ends, the equation looks exactly the same. It's basically just the frequency here is equal to n times the v, the velocity of the wave which in, I said in some cases it's just sound, some cases you have to calculate it like we had to do here. And then this is two times the length of the organ pipe instead of the string here. So that's one, so one two times the length. So this is what the equation just looks like with subs, with units, not with units, with um, variables. So yeah, variables. Fundamental frequency, that means N is one. Velocity of sound is 334 length of the thing is the organ pipe is 
So this will be 115 hertz. Okay, so that is the answer. They're asking, what is the final temperature of water mixture that results when 40 grams of ice that is initially at negative 10 degrees Celsius is added to 200 grams of ice that is initially at 60 degrees Celsius? And they give us the specific heats and the heat diffusion of water. What this means is that you have an initial, initially you have this ice that is 40 grams. And first, so the ice, let me draw to you what the ice would do. It's initially at negative 10. It would have to increase right, through the ice stage, meaning using the specific heat capacity of the ice. It would have to go to zero degrees Celsius where it would hit the melting point or the fusion point, whatever you want to call it. And then it's going to stay at the fusion point, but here it's going to melt. So this would be use of heat of fusion you'd use here. Then it has to go uh, 20 degrees. Yeah, what is this? We don't know how many degrees it's up to, but it would go to some temperature. So whatever the final temperature is. And this would be in the water state. So we'd use the specific heat capacity of water. So 40 grams. And the specific heat capacity here is given in cal calories per grams, which is kind of unconventional. Specific heat of ice is zero, so this is 0 0.5. And we know that initially the ice is, has to go up 10 degrees Celsius. So this is starting at 10 uh, minus zero. So really the, the, the kind of template for this is mass, specific heat capacity, delta T, which I like to write as temperature final minus temperature initial. So that's what the ice does initially. And then what the ice does, it has to melt. So the multiply for melting, you multiply the mass of the ice times the heat of fusion, which is just, where's the heat of fusion? Right there, 80 cal calories per grams. Then the ice has to be heated up to some temperature, not the ice, the ice that is now melted and is water, the same mass, because conservation of mass, is gonna be the specific heat capacity of water in this case. So specific heat capacity of water is one calorie per, per gram. And then the temperature change, we don't know what it, the final temperature of the system is, that's kind of what they're asking, I think. Yeah, the final temperature of the water mixture minus the initial temperature of the ice that was just melted, meaning it was is just zero. Okay, it started off at zero. So, if I move this nonsense down, I have space to do stuff. There's another Q, um, term here for the water that was just there initially that wasn't in ice it was water 200 grams it was its mass specific capacity is this is just water one calorie per gram and we don't know it's final but we don't know initially it was 60 all right let me get some water We know that all the Qs have to equal zero at, at the end, so I mean, I, I didn't really subscript these. These are not the same values. So we know that Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4 is zero. So I'm gonna solve these individually, and then I'll, at the end I'll set them equal to zero and add them up. Add them up and then set them equal to zero is the better way to say that. So 200 here. That's calories, by the way. At the end, it won't matter because if, if the units of energy are all consistent, whether it's joules, kilojoules, calories, you'll be fine at the end. But just make sure they're all the same units. So if it gives you the heat of fusion in kilojoules, please convert to joules if you're using joules and everything else, which you usually are. This is just this is just TF, and so that's 40 temperature final. And then here, this is 200 temperature final minus 60 times 200 is 1,200. Okay, so then if I set, if I add the, all these up, so 2, 200 plus, actually, hold on, let me just do this in my calculator. I'm not gonna go, I'm not going into detail with the arithmetic, obviously, because it would just take, this would be five hours long if I was doing that. 
So let's make it 240. And we can go 2200. So at the end, that's kind of what you get. And then if you, hmm. did I goof up here? That'll be negative value. That won't make sense. Uh, yeah, I went through it too quick. Let me just do it slowly. I apologize for the confusion, if any was caused. 200 plus 3,200. Hmm, let's see the problem. Okay. So if I do All right, so the answer is D. Once you do the math, just make sure to take all these Qs, and I don't know why this looks like a C now instead of a Q. Take these Qs and set them equal to zero, and then solve the math on that. So yeah, good luck on the al algebra. All right. Being honest, if at this point you can't do the math, I really I don't I can't help you. Not to say that in a in a mean way, just in general. Glass window with the area of, okay, so this equation, or this problem uses the equation that says thermal conductivity is K, which is the thermal, this is not thermal conductivity. This is the heat uh, flow rate. So this is how much heat flows per second. So this is basically in units of watts or joules per second, this Q dot here. This is thermal conductivity of the substance. This is the area of the substance. This is the uh, change in temperature from one side to another. This is the length. So if I were to explain this with a with an example here, let's say we have a um, what is the thing here? Is this glass? Okay, let's say we have a glass, and let's say we have it like this. Okay. Now let's say that the area, let's say that the length times width of the, the glass is the area. Let's say that this side of it, so this side that we're on, has a certain temperature that's really high. And let's say the other side has a temperature that's really low. And so the temperature of the high minus temperature of the low will give you delta T. Okay, so that's this thing. And then the area, which is area of this surface, is going to give you that value. Okay. Now K is, is a, it depends on substance. So on, for this glass here, it's like 0 0.8. So it depends on substance. All right. And this L, you might be wondering what this L is. This is usually the thickness of the material. So this is like what thickness the material is. So this is like um, the L here is not the same. I really should have just maybe used a different thing, but maybe this is just L. It's just subscript. This I don't know. Yeah. So the L is the thickness of the, the material. So now what happens here? If you have something that's hot and it's something that's cold. What heat is going to do is go from the hot thing to the cold thing, so it's going to flow this way. The rate at which it flows is the Q dot. Okay, so I just want you to have kind of an understanding of what this means. I think it helps a little bit to solve this problem. But besides that, it's, it's just for this problem you can plug and chug. I don't know if you can do it in other problems. You probably need to understand a little bit of the concept. So glass window with an area of 1.3. So the area is 1.3. Uh, thickness, again, thickness is usually the L value here. So the thickness is 4 millimeters. So let me divide that by 1,000, 0 0.004. Change in temperature here is it's 10.5 and then negative 5. So it's 10.5 minus negative 5, which is just, yeah, 
15.5 again it'll be the same for Kelvin and Celsius because Celsius is just Kelvin displaced by 273 values so the, whatever you subtract it's just going to be the same in Kelvin and Celsius thermal conductivity of this glass is 0 0.8 this is just depend on the substance so now we can solve the Q the Q dot So this will be 40, 30 watts or joules per second, which is basically the same thing as watts. All right, let me delete all this. Air is confined to an atmospheric pressure of 1.13 kilopascals in a cylinder whose volume is 0 0.22 meters squared when eight kilocalories of heat is added. The volume increases at constant pressure of 0 0.35 meters cubed. Calculate the increase in internal energy of the air. So internal energy, change in internal energy at least, is equal to the heat that is either given or taken away from the system, uh, minus the work that the system does or is done on the system. Your professor might use a different sign convention, but this is what Professor Keen does. So. They're asking for the delta U or the change in internal energy. For Q, we can calculate that using how much heat was added. So we know that um, Q is 8 kilocalories, which 1 kilocalorie is 4186 joules. So that's 4186 times 8. And this will be 33488. Three, eight. The fact that they have answer choices in different units is really annoying to me. But you can easily convert. Conversion unit is not too bad. Now, work, if the pressure is constant, then the work is just this. If pressure is constant, if it's uh, iso, I think it's called isobaric, please do not assume this in any other circumstance besides when the pressure is constant. It is the pressure uh, times delta V. Delta V is change in volume, which is volume final minus volume initial. Okay. In this case, that's equal to, the pressure is this. So in that in pa pascals, it has to be pascals, by the way. It's that times 1,000, so this 1, 1, 300. And then the volume final was 0 0.35. And the volume initial, I wrote my five is very bad today. Okay. 0 0.22 is there. Okay. Keep in mind if, if uh, this, this delta V value here can be negative, okay? Like this delta V that I wrote, so. Sometimes work will be negative, meaning that somebody pushed the piston down and did work on the system. So this um, equals 13169 joules. So that plus 3348. We get something like. Now, this is not in the answer, any of the answer choices, so you just convert it. Convert to what was it kilocalories? So you get four point eight five, which is this. All right. Car Carnot engine takes in three hundred kilocalories of heat per cycle from the high temperature reservoir and delivers one of one of five kilocalories at low temperatures or what is the efficiency if you have a car not uh, heat engine that is going to be the efficiency the car not efficiency based on the bottom of the second page of the equation sheet is one minus temperature low so this is um, well okay i guess we're not really doing temperature but since it's car efficiency what this means is that the, that the qh and again i'm not going to explain this in detail because just don't have time for this. Take forever. If it's Carnot, if Carnot, right? These are going to be proportional to each other. The 
ratio of the heats and the temperatures. So therefore, the, the actual equation on our equation sheet says, it does not say that, it says this. But since these are proportional, we can just use this as, a, as opposed to, to the temperatures. And it would still work, okay? So I'm gonna use the, the Qs here. And we have, so since these are the same units, both in kilocalories, you're fine to use that. Okay. But do not plug uh, Celsius into this. Use, use Kelvin into those. Okay. So this is 1 minus the 300 calories from the high temperature reservoir and 105 from the low temperature reservoir. Am I on something right now? This is the other way around. I am so sorry. This is the other way. It's, it's, it's low over high okay, for heat engines. So this is 0 0.65 for the efficiency. All right. Okay. The coefficient of performance of an ideal refrigerator ma maintains an inside temperature. I'm so sorry. What is the coefficient of performance of an ideal refrigerator that maintains an inside temperature of 4 degrees Celsius when the room is 30 degrees Celsius? So the coefficient of performance for an ideal refrigerator is... Um, Temperature low, temperature high minus temperature low. All right. So temperature low is temperature inside the refrigerator. Temperature high is temperature outside the refrigerator. That's pretty straightforward. Temperature inside the refrigerator is cold. Now we have to convert these to Kelvin. So this would be um, 273 plus 4 is 277. I don't know why I don't trust myself on this. Yeah, it's 277 Kelvin. And this is... Uh, 303, just again, I don't trust myself there. So 277, 303, 277, you'd plug it in just pretty simply. I wish I could explain, or if I had time and energy right now to explain how refrigerators and heat engines work, I would, but um, at this point, Nah. All right. So when you solve this, you get 10.6. Okay. Okay, this problem, okay, I might have to actually explain how an engine works. So, it's a little bit complicated. The way an engine works is you'd have a, a high temperature reservoir, so temperature is high. Let's scroll down for just, just one minute here to explain this. And you have the engine, and you have the low temperature place, low temperature reservoir, or the cold reservoir, whatever you call this. The way in which we extract energy from it is that a certain amount of heat, QH, flows into the engine, and a certain amount of heat, QL, flows out of the engine. Now, in between this process, a little bit of the heat is converted to work, and this is the stuff that's useful that we can use to run things like cars and, I don't know, just anything that is powered by work. Now, what this means is that we're putting in a certain amount of heat and we're getting out work and more heat. Not more heat, but actually less heat in terms of quantity. Which means if you do the conservation of energy equation for this engine, we have heat that comes in, and then what comes out is should, should be the exact same in terms of energy. So work plus the QL. All right. So that's how a heat engine works. Now, let's explain how, um, for a minute, how entropy works. If you have an object and you take a certain amount of heat out of it, okay, and let's say it's at a certain temperature, whatever the temperature may be, is, is, the delta S, the change in, temp change in entropy of that object is gonna be the Q over the temperature. Now this Q value, if you take heat out of the object, it's, it's gonna be a negative value, okay? 
the Q is going to be negative. If you put heat into the object, it's going to be positive. Okay, so entropy changes depending on whether you um, put heat into the object or out of the object. And in this case, the surroundings, uh, in this case, in the problem, the objects are going to be these reservoirs. Uh, and you're going to add up the, res the, the entropy of the two reservoirs based on what the engine does. All right, so engine operates at 50% efficiency, not 50% efficiency, but 50% of the car not efficiency. And so it operates between reservoirs of 400 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius. So meaning this is 400 degrees Celsius for it. And this is 100 degrees Celsius. And it says, calculate the change in entropy of the surroundings. Surroundings means the reservoirs. When the engine does 10 kilojoules of work. Meaning, this is really not 400. This is 673 Kelvin. And this really is just uh, 373 Kelvin. Okay. So if we want to calculate the car not efficiency of this, for a heat engine, it's 1 minus TL over TH, which is equal to... 1 minus, we know TL here is 373 Kelvin. 673 Kelvin is the high temperature reservoir. So, so the Carnot efficiency, and this is not efficiency, but efficiency Carnot, meaning the maximum possible efficiency given the reservoirs we have, is 0 0.446, or 44.6%, really. But we're told that we're operating at 50% of that. So we're not perfectly efficient because it's literally energetically impossible, but we're also not perfectly efficient given that restriction because we lose energy to other sources like friction and sound and whatever whatever else. So this, since 50% of the Carnot efficiency, you get the Carnot efficiency times 0 0.5 okay, for 50%. So the value I get is the actual efficiency after you count for all the ways in which you'd be inefficient, you get 0 0.223 or 22.3%, okay? Now, since this is the actual freq actual uh, efficiency, you can use the equation that's to the right. Um, the equation is efficiency is QH, or no, work over QH, okay? And as we discussed earlier, QH is um, work plus Q, plus uh, QL, okay? Um, hold on, let me think for a moment. They're saying the engine does, okay. Okay, got it. So in order to find the entropy when the engine does 10 kilojoules of work, what you need to do, as I explained before, the way you find entropy, which I explained before, for the low temperature reservoir, the equation for its entropy would be QH over T. Now, QH, since you're taking heat out, as I said, it's going to be negative of, the, of that. And for the low temperature reservoir, since you're putting heat into it, right, the arrow points into it, it's going to be positive of that. And the temperature here is going to be temperature of the high reservoir, so this is 673, and this is going to be the low reservoir, which is um, 373. And how do we find QH and QL? Well, we have efficiency, and we have this equation, and we know that QH effectively is just work plus QL based on this principle that we explained earlier. So that means that if we know work and it's you know it's 10 kilojoules, that means if we saw if we substitute in 10,000 joules into the work and since we know that this is efficiency um, let me rewrite this 0 0.223 
is work over work plus QL. And once we know QL, we can find QH using this, okay? So, I should do this. 10,000, 10,000 for work plus QL. If we solve for QL, let me do that real quick. Must have messed something up. Yeah, let me actually do this without trying to rush. Yeah, let's do this properly. If I replace these out and I kind of put this, so I get 10,000 and 0 0.223. So QL equals. And I apologize for being all over the place with this, but this problem is just detailed to try and understand. So QL is that. QH would be uh, that plus 1,000, which was because the work in this equation. So QH is that times 10,000. That times 10,000, not 1,000. 4, 4, 8, 4, 3 joules. So in our equations, we can just plug in these values for QH and QL. So heat of heat coming out of the hot reservoir, heat coming into the low reservoir, low temperature reservoir. So if I plug these things in, this was 673, the temperature of the low, temperature of the high uh, temperature reservoir. Negative 4, 4, 8, 4, 3. And this was... Three, four, eight, four, three times no, multiplied. Multiplied one around three divided by three seventy three. Okay. Right. So this the change in entropy here is negative sixty six point six three joules per kelvin on top, and then on the bottom here it's. Ninety-three point four joules per Kelvin positive. So if you add these up, should be twenty-six point seven eight joules per Kelvin. And if you look at thirty-four, E is the answer. Okay, so that is, yeah. I bet most more people, people who get that right, out of those people, more than probably guessed and actually did this. All right. Density of air is 1.29 kilograms per meters cubed at zero degrees, and at one team, 18 of pressure. What is density um, temperature at the same pressure? Okay, this to me is again another stupid problem. We know that pressure times volume is moles times RT. Okay, R being the constant, T being temperature. Now we know that mass is effectively the same as, or I'm sorry, moles of a, of a gas is essentially the same as its mass over molar mass. Okay. So we know that we can basically divide by volume multiplied by molar mass and we get m over v which is density okay if we isolate m over v we will get pressure times molar mass divided by rt now here's the problem we said molar mass molar mass and this mass thing are both in grams not kilograms and the unit here is grams so therefore um yeah this gets a little bit weird This mass here would actually have to be divided by a thousand in order to match these units. But since it's divided by a thousand, that can be moved to the bottom effectively. 
didn't mean to erase the m there. And then once it's moved to the bottom, we can just move it to the top of the other side, so that becomes the equation. Now we know that there's one thing in these, there's two situations that give us, it says the density of air is this much at one ATM, and what is density when we change the temperature? So there's two situations here. The only thing that is the same across these two situations should be the molar mass. The molar mass shouldn't change. Now for some reason when I do this problem, the molar mass is really low, but you know, just shut off and calculate, I guess. It still gives me the right answer. So the density of the air is 1.29 as we're told, and we made sure everything was in the right units. This should be 8.3145. Temperature is zero degrees Celsius, so it's basically STP. A thousand, just because the units. Pressure is one ATM, which is 1.013 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. Molar mass is the thing that's constant across two situations, so therefore we're going to solve for that and then plug it into the second situation. So if I calculate for this, it'll be something like 2.891 times 10 to the negative fifth, which sounds crazy, like that even if you take into account the unit thing with kilograms, that doesn't make sense to me at all. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the calculation works out. So, if we want to solve for the density when the temperature is 42, so we go MV. So we're solving for MV, which is density, which is also just density like this. Times 1,000 times pressure, which is the same pressure it says, so it's just... times the molar mass of this weird thing we got, which doesn't make sense in my head, but, okay. And then 8.3145 and temperature, which is 42 degrees Celsius would be, what's the Kelvin on that? 315. Is that right? That doesn't sound good, hold on. Okay, so if we do this, yep, so the density I get is 1.118 kilograms per meters cubed, which is around D right there, so just round that. Neutrons in a nuclear reactor are in thermal equilibrium with their surroundings. What is the VRMS, sorry, what is their RMS speed if the temperature is 445 degrees Celsius? So the VRMS, or the RMS speed is square root of 3 kT, K being the Boltzmann constant, T being the temperature, over the mass of the thing you're, you're concerned with. Okay, mass of the particle, if you're doing um, like a mass of a gas particle, usually the, the thing that'll be useful here is going like this, 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27, and then molar mass. Sometimes they'll just give you the mass of the, the particle, like just directly like this, and that'll be really easy, so you don't have to do any of this. You can just say mass, and plug that in, all right? So if I do this, Mass is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27. K is the Boltzmann constant here, so that's 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23. And then temperature here is going to be 445 degrees Celsius. So if you convert that to Kelvin, that'll be 718 Kelvin. So if you just multiply all these together and then square root it, That is, yeah, that is 4218.9 meters per second, which is close to E. So I hope this was helpful. I hope you do well on this exam and on your other finals. 
and yeah, good luck studying.